going on, fellas? It's your boy, GS Luke, here with our first showdown preview of the year. Super hyped to get into it. We'll be doing main slate previews, all of these showdown previews for all of the main primetime games out there that you have on Thursday, Sunday night, and then there on Monday. Going to have you covered for all of those. But here, importantly, going to touch on this Rams versus Bills game. You've got ourselves two of the best teams in the league, you know, let alone in the conference, right? You know, one of the better teams in the AFC versus last year's Super Bowl champions, the Rams, they're out of the NFC. So I'm looking forward to that. But more importantly, a lot of firepower. You've got Josh Allen on one side, that whole offense with Stephon Diggs, a few additions to that offense too, that we'll have to talk about. And on the other side of things, a completely retold, I should say reloaded is probably the better word for it, Rams offense. You have Cooper Cup, you have Stafford back, you know, a few departures like a Robert Woods, but also the addition of somebody like an Allen Robinson. So it's not like they completely reloaded a few guys that had to be swapped out of there, and perhaps they're even better with this iteration. So expect fireworks from either side. We're going to touch on, first off, my projections. We'll go through some of my top plays here for the first day. And then on top of that, also going to go through ownership, game theory, how I'm making a few of my lineups for GPPs as opposed to going for contests in a cash sort of build, giving you an idea of exactly what to expect going into this week. So from injuries, from again, that game theory, trying to play ownership, all that sort of thing, you're going to be covered from every aspect. So without any more diddy dallying, let's go ahead and hop on into this thing. Alrighty, we've got our projections on the screen, and the first thing we're going to touch on here is going to be the game environment, a few of the game scripts that I think you might want to keep an eye on and perhaps incorporate into your analysis, because just to give you my top-level perspective here, Showdown is by far my niche when it comes to playing fantasy football. I love fantasy leagues from the season-long perspective. Best ball, I go out there, do a lot of content for that. You guys have seen some of the live streams so far, but... From week to week, right, in terms of my DFS exposure, it is almost entirely from the showdown perspective. For main slates, I play a little bit lower dollar. Now, I'm still going to be putting out content for that, still playing it myself. When it comes to actually grinding out ROI, I have found a lot more success personally here on the single game size rather than going out there and playing a 12 to 13 game slate. Those can be a little bit more volatile. You have to hit the absolute nuts to take down one of those tournaments. And with so many combinations out there, I mean, with 13 teams worth of players to choose from, it's hard to get to that outcome. Whereas when you have two teams against each other, it's a lot easier to cover a wider set of outcomes and win a little bit more consistently, maybe not in terms of percentage ROI, I'd say they're pretty comparable between showdown and then main slates. It's just that there's a lot more volatility when you're going out there and playing on a main slate. Here in showdown, at least personally, right, it can be different for a lot of people out there. That's why you should be tracking your results. I have a lot more consistent results here with the showdown side. So from the game script perspective, we have an over under here at 53 points. So that's important to consider. Vegas definitely is sizing this up as a relatively high scoring affair, not in terms of that Below, I should say, like shootout category, we're getting closer to 56, maybe even 58 implied points, which you'll see from time to time, but still up there at 53 points. Buffalo is favored at two and a half, which is also a little bit eye-opening, considering that they are on the road. They are going against the Super Bowl champions. They are still the favorite there. But when you look at the Super Bowl odds, they're the clear on favorite right now, right? Plus um, 550 is the last that I saw on Buffalo at the sports book that I have access to. And it makes sense. They've got Josh Allen seemingly getting into the prime of his career, a defense that was already elite last year, top five in both points scored and with the runs, I should say, yards allowed perspective. And then on top of that, added Von Miller to the fold, which is an elite level pass rusher. I guess the one thing that their defense was really lacking was that third down pass rushing presence that could go out there and wreck the game. Now they have that on top of a secondary that's at least top five in the NFL in a linebacking core that is more than serviceable. So on the offensive side of things, while they do lack a few skill position players, I mean, they do have Josh Allen, who could pretty much make up for it himself. I mean, we saw that last year. He pretty much carried that offense to unworldly offensive numbers. So despite both of these teams being absolutely loaded on defense, I mean, you know, we're talking about the Bills here, but let's give a little bit of love to LA as well. They have Aaron Donald. They have somebody like Jalen Ramsey on the outside, studs all over that team on every level from the defensive line, linebackers, also that secondary, a few stud safeties. 
just studs all over the field, right? For all four quadrants, offense and defense from both sides. You're going to have people that are in the Pro Bowl. They're in Hawaii at the end of the year, unless they make it to the Super Bowl, right? So they have a further aspiration. So perhaps they won't be making it for that reason. But you're looking at just a high pedigree game, like from every perspective, right? You're going to see a lot of sharp football played. I guess, except for the fact that it's the first game, right? You're going to see a few unworldly penalties, but at least from just a talent perspective, uh, you're going to be far-fetched to find a better set two of teams. I mean, two teams that I think could end up actually matching up in the Super Bowl at the end of the year. With all that aside, I don't know if I agree with the total. They have it as a little bit of a shootout here at 53 points. I would project it a little bit lower than that. In fact, for all the sims that I've been running and that I'm using with these projections, I have it closer to a 51 in point, point implied total. In fact, I also have the line there at minus three and a half for Buffalo. So I have them favored by three and a half implied points, which is a little bit surprising. I will have to say uh, they are two and a half favorites for the you know Vegas, right? And I said it might be a little bit surprising, but when I go through all of my metrics, I mean, especially you know projecting a little bit of progression for somebody like Josh Allen, right? If we're expecting him to get better, and he was already almost historically good last year, I mean, you're just going to see other otherworldly efficiency from this team, particularly adding Von Miller on defense. They project to be an even better team. And last year, you know, heads up, I would actually have taken Buffalo anyways, at least per my personal EV projection. So uh, it makes sense, at least for my numbers, but maybe for some of you out there, it might be a little bit surprising, but I just want to give you the reasoning behind that. So you're going to see a lot of the players we're talking about here are going to be on the Buffalo side because my main strategy when it comes to playing DFS here is to play those game scripts. And I will literally run different sets of projections out there to make sets of 30, sometimes 50 lineups. I'll go out there, run three to five different scripts. I'm running three, it'll be for sets of 50 lineups. I go out there, I enter the 150 max for pretty much every single showdown slate. It's either the $5, sometimes it's the $15. Depends on, uh, I guess, how confident or filling going into that slate. It's gonna be the $15 for the first one, of course, you know, kicking off the year. But I always play certain sets of lineups. It's never going to be one set of 150 using the same sort of projections. So over here, you see my projected points. This is median points, okay? This isn't something that you know I'd be running projections with. I'm going to be using different simulations when I actually go out there and execute my lineup. So you know, if you're looking for that process, how I do that, just to get an idea of it, make sure to go down in the Patreon page. I will give you an idea there. Um, we'll be doing live streams of me actually making my lineups live how I actually go out and execute that sort of thing. But it's important to consider because when Josh Allen has a really good day, or I guess more importantly, it's better to backtrack this, when somebody like Stephon Diggs or Gabriel Davis has a nuclear day, you know almost certainly that Josh Allen is too, right? So when you're building lineups, you don't want to start with a Josh Allen and then get to somebody like a Gabriel Davis. You want to be using somebody like Gabriel Davis to get to a Josh Allen, right? Or maybe even more importantly, towards the bottom of the board, getting you know, from somebody like a Van Jefferson Jr., right? Maybe assuming that he has two touchdowns over 100 yards. That means that Matthew Stafford, more than likely with his production through other wide receivers, is likely getting to at least a near optimal performance too, particularly at like $10,800. So when I run these projections, you know, I'll run a simulation, right? It's not based on a median projection. These over here, um, somebody's projection is correlated, Certainly, that's for sure, right, with other players here on the field, but it's not the end-all, be-all, right? You'll see a little bit of differences there. That's the reason for that. But when I'm actually going through and entering lineups, it's a lot more procedural. So understand that, but um, we will talk about just guys that I'm going to have in my pool pretty much regardless. One of them has to be Josh Allen, right? $12,000. He plays for Buffalo. He's 18000 at the captain slot. So I have him down as a yes right now. I'm actually not sure if in my set of 150, he's going to actually make it into the captain pool because the only way I see him getting to the optimal captain at $18,000, um, and you can make the same argument here for Matthew Stafford, who we're going to talk about here in a second, is they've got to get to like 26 plus points. That's the number I use for somebody above $11,000. You can see it's 10800 for Stafford, so it's close enough. But certainly for Josh Allen at $12,000, he's got to get to 26 plus real points, which you know at the captain slot would be right around a 40-point performance. You need 40 plus points from your captain 
in anything remotely close to a 50-point game, right? I have it projected for closer to 51 points rather than the 53 that Vegas has it at here. But Josh Allen, he's more than capable of getting there. Whereas a Matthew Stafford, who I don't have on here, right? Some of them are blacked out. I do have to say, if you want access to all of my projections, right, you're going to have to check out the Patreon page. That's what that's for there. But I can tell you he's not in my captain pool. There's a little bit of a, I guess, behind-the-scenes access there uh, because he doesn't have that rushing upside. The thing that changes Josh Allen's projection is that he could go out there, score us, you know, a rushing touchdown, maybe get us 20 to 25 yards. And that eight and a half, nine point edge that he's getting there could take him from having one of his average weeks, which is right around 21, 22 passing points to over 30 real points, which at the captain slot might be 45 points there, right? And 18,000 might make a little bit of sense. But regardless, at the flex spot, I'm going to have a ton of exposure. In fact, if I don't have him in my captain slot at all, I may have 100% of him in my flex spot. He might be somebody that I'm locking here for the slate because even at that price tag, there's enough cheap guys that we're going to talk about a little bit later that you can play that you can make it work. I mean, low owned plays too. So even though Josh Allen had projected for nearly 70% ownership at the flex spot, um, it's somebody that I'm personally going to be willing to get to. So I like him there. I, we'll talk about Cooper Cup. Right? I know I have him blacked out here, but we'll talk about him in general. Prolific player. One of the best fantasy seasons we've ever seen, right? Especially from a volume perspective there in 2021. Uh, we have to expect him to also be awesome, right? So even though he lost Robert Woods, the added Allen Robinson. And I've seen a lot of people talk about Allen Robinson being added is like this huge negative and I know Robert Woods right got hurt right that added a lot of value to Cooper Cup there at the end of the year before that Cup was still killing it right and he still had Robert Woods next to him who's now a number one wide receiver down there in Tennessee or I guess he's listed as number two he's he's really that number one on that team Burks isn't number one yet um He's still dealing with, you know, a pretty decent sidekick, but he's done that before and still averaged well over 25 fantasy points per game. So don't be fooled there. I still haven't projected for close to 22 points. Um, he's going to get a ton of ownership, both in the flex and he's outside of Josh Allen, the highest owned player at the captain slot. So you're definitely going to have to think twice about using him there for the slate, but he's definitely at least in my flex pool. I can tell you that at the very least, um, but that shouldn't surprise anybody. Stafford, we talked about, I like quite a bit. The price tag at 10800 is also relatively favorable. So I think he's somebody that you have to explore. I just think a little bit less viable in the captain slot just because of the lack of rushing upside. Like he's going to have, a, I'd say, a ceiling like a true ceiling of maybe 28 fantasy points. Uh, he's going to get to 23, 24 a few times in a year, maybe four or five, but he's going to live in the 18 to 22 point range for a majority of his outcomes, right? He's not really going to get you the, to that 30 point performance, whereas Josh Allen is probably going to do that, you know, get to 30 points at least a handful of times this year. And I know he's more expensive, right? So you expect a little bit more out of Josh Allen there in the captain slot, but you don't expect to like too little much, right? Like you expect Stafford can't go to like 26 points, right? He's still got to get to like 30 points, right? Because Josh Allen can get you to 35 fantasy points. Uh, the $1,200 difference there isn't as big as some people may think, right? You still can save some salary. Again, there's going to be some guys down here that we talk about. Uh, James Cook's one of them. We're going to talk about Tommy Sweeney a little bit later on. He's only $400. Uh, you can more than fit these guys into laps and even use them together. Let's move down to the 9K range, uh, more of the skill position players, the guys that, you know, now you're starting to save a little bit on. You can, you know, start with one of those studs above 10K and then, you know, take one to two of the guys here from 9000 down to $6,000, um, round out your lineup that sort of way. This is really what we see being the optimal build a lot more often than not, a little bit more of a balanced build as opposed to what I see a lot of people out there doing. But Stefan Diggs. I'm not sure if I like him here, and the reason why is his ownership is otherworldly. We've got him at nearly 50% right now. I got him at 12% at the captain slot, which is also getting up there. But the real problem I have is last year's production. A lot of people are giving him a, a pass for it. They're assuming that it was just due to variance, that he may have just had a down year, and maybe he's just not that elite-level wide receiver. Maybe he had you know, a case of volume up there um, in Minnesota because, you know, somebody like Justin Jefferson, definitely a great talent, maybe top three talent in terms of NFL wide receiver production and just going out there and having the skills to be a wide receiver. I, he went out there, had an otherworldly season as a rookie, right? That's not going to happen in a normal offense. That offense is so concentrated on its top three pass catchers, its top three skill position players. You're going to go out there and go absolutely nuclear pretty much no matter who you are. 
So Stephon Diggs came from that environment up here to a little bit more of a traditional offense there in Buffalo and struggled. Maybe with that sort of game environment, he's just not an elite level wide receiver. And I worry that he's being treated like he's just somebody like a Justin Jefferson, somebody like a Jamar Chase that were projected for like 20 to 25 points every week. I'm projected for 18.6 points. That's not bad, right? And at nine grand, that projects for one of the better projections on the slate in terms of points per dollar projection. However, he's 50% owned. Now, 60, 70% for some of these quarterbacks. It's definitely stomachable. They have unbelievably high floors. Stephon Diggs has a single digit point floor. Like he could go out there, get shut down, post you like nine, maybe 10 fantasy points, which would be horrendous. Absolutely train wreck sort of performance there at nine grand. Um, I worry about that quite a bit. So I'm personally not going to be there on Stefan Diggs. I'm going to be fading him in a lot of my lineups, at least as of right now. A lot of it is ownership dependent, but uh, we'll have to see. If he's going to be 47.8%, uh, he's likely going to be a fade for me. Gabe Davis, on the other hand, so $1,800 less expensive. You're looking at it right around half the ownership. You're also looking at a lot more flexibility. You're starting with maybe one, two of those studs above 10 grand. You might be able to take as a third man in somebody like a Gabriel Davis. And I'd argue, you know, a lot of people may refute this, right? That this second year wide receiver bump is massive. Like these guys that are going from year one to year two, you always see a ton of them break out. And by breakout, I mean going from like kind of unknown names that you've never heard of to legitimate top 10 top 15 wide receivers in the NFL. Gabriel Davis looks like that guy to me. He's a very, very large target. He's definitely got the speed to go out there and crack a defense off the top. And on top of that, he's also got a quarterback in an offensive scheme that's going to go out there and absolutely print money. So at $7,200, you can even put him at captain for $10,800. I really like that prospect. In fact, he might be my favorite captain play on the entire slate just because I have him at 6.8% owned, which, you know, isn't non-existent, definitely in terms of captain ownership, right? It's a lot more significant than, you know, what 6.8% would be in the flex spot. But I think it's well, like well warranted to get over the field there, like something like 15 to 20%. So I'm going to have my eye on that. Hopefully the ownership stays a little bit tempered throughout the week. You know, if he's 25% and 6.8% at the captain slot, I'm going to be over the field in both departments, let alone, you know, well over there at captain. I'll still probably have at least 40, 50% at the flex position as well. So putting him in close to maybe even three quarters of my lineups. And again, I'm probably going to have Josh Allen in 100%. I also like the idea of using Allen Robinson at the captain slot. So, you know, these aren't going to be my only three captains. The ones that I have here, you know, a lot of them are exited out will be added to the poll throughout the week. But I do like Allen Robinson as a buyback, maybe even in a losing game script as a potential captain, because if they're losing, Matthew Stafford is still going to throw the ball. But I'd like Allen Robinson as the buyback there at captain, not Matthew Stafford, because first off, price difference, right? $6,200. And there's a legitimate chance that Allen Robinson, I mean, just he's a wide receiver one talent, right? He's playing behind Cooper Cup could just have some monster games this year, right? But double coverage on Cooper Cup, he was number two in the NFL in terms of double coverage percentage. You could have Allen Robinson with single over-the-top coverage with that large body, getting you these 60 to 70-yard receptions. So I really like his upside, particularly as like a captain where you're getting that one and a half point X boost, where he could go out there, get you that 100-yard bonus, get you a touchdown, maybe seven to eight catches, and get you a little 25 to 30 point bonus. And, you know, unlike a quarterback at $10,000, 25 points from Allen Robinson might end up being the optimal captain play, right? Because you're only spending nine grand at captain at that point. You can take both quarterbacks really easily. Or in fact, you know, if you wanted to make it a whole Ram stack, right, you could take Stafford in that lineup and Cooper Cup there and still afford a relatively balanced build. That's the type of lineup that I think a lot of people need to consider and that they don't enough here with Showdown, right? Because, you know, people want to take in these quarterbacks over there with their captain, which makes a lot of sense. You're, you know, locking in, quote unquote, a lot of points. But to get to a true GPP winning outcome, which is what 90, maybe even 99% of out, you out there are playing in terms of your weekly exposure, uh, getting, you know, 40 points from your captain, but spending 18,000, most of the times isn't enough. Like, especially if you look at the winning lineups there, you're going to see somebody that's a lot more creative, usually a lot more cheaper there in that captain slot. Um, so I would challenge a lot of you out there to try and play people like a Gabriel Davis, people like an Allen Robinson III, a little bit more in that slot for your 2022 season.
Quick little plug here of my Patreon page. A link is in the description. It is $10 a month, and that is where you can get access to all of my projections. I've been doing it for golf for quite some time. It's been $10 a month. I've added a $10 tier for NFL, but also a combo tier that gives you access to both sports. So if you're out there, already have access to the golf data like over 200 of you out there do, then just go over, hit the combo tier. It's an extra $6 charge there. If you already have access to the golf data, it'll just add it on top. But for anybody just looking for NFL projections, there is the $10 tier there too. I'll be doing all of my projections for showdown for the main slates. We'll be doing just projected points. Also, in terms of expected ownership, everything that you see used in the video here will be uploaded on there to Patreon. And really, it's a good research tool, right? You'll probably have access to a few other websites as well as pretty much everyone in the industry does, right? If you're a smart DFS player, you should probably be using at least three to four different sources. The thing that I like about what I offer is I try to condense it all into one spreadsheet, right? Make it as easy to read as possible where you can have your optimizer up on one tab and then have my spreadsheet up on the other and really have... I don't want to say all the information that you need, but pretty damn close to it. So that's the idea there. Again, a link is down below. We're doing it for all the showdown and all the main slates throughout the season. And make sure to check out the combo tier if you're already a part of the golf page. All right, other than somebody like Alan Robinson III, a few people I want to point out here right around six grand. Also, one of his LA Rams teammates would have to be Tyler Higby. And while he's a little bit touchdown dependent, and pretty much any lineup that I'm playing with Higby, I'm certainly going to be pairing him up with somebody like a Matthew Stafford. I like him at 5600 bucks. You know, he's one of these mid-tier options where he posts a 15 to 18 point game. You're absolutely going to have to have him to hit the nuts in one of these showdown lineups. So at 5600 I think he makes sense. I wouldn't use him in the captain slot though. So I just wanted to mention a little bit there. Also Darrell Henderson Jr. He's listed as the number two running back right now. So not the lead back. As of right now, that is Cam Akers, who I kind of just glossed over a little bit, but I don't want to talk about every player here. He's going to get plenty of usage. The question is how much, because Darrell Henderson Jr. always seems to spell him a little bit more than maybe his fantasy users or fantasy owners would like. You know, Darrell Henderson Jr., go out there, get you 8 to 10 carries. That's 8 to 10 carries that somebody like Cam Akers isn't getting. So it can be a little bit frustrating to play an LA Rams back when you don't know how the usage is going to pan out. It is going to be especially annoying here for week one. We have no idea if Sean McVay has cooked up any sort of wrinkles in the offseason. It is going to throw us fantasy owners off. That is definitely well within the cards. In fact, Maybe Darrell Henderson Jr. doesn't even get backup work. Perhaps Kyron Williams here at $1,400 ends up getting some of that backup run. So in terms of my projections, I do think that it will be Henderson as the backup, but you would be absolutely remiss not to play somebody like Williams this week, just in hopes that he goes out there and ends up getting a little bit of run. I mean, he's $1,400. We're going to talk about some of these cheapies later on, but that's one thing to remember here about week one is that we're still early in the season. There's a lot that we're going to have to learn. So for guys like a Jamison Crowder, for example, who as of right now is listed as the team's number four wide receiver, maybe you take a shot on him, right? He's more expensive than he should be. Isaiah McKenzie down here at $2,400 is questionable as of right now, but I do expect him to suit up for week one. If he does, he's going to be like 50% owned. He's going to be one of the higher owned players on the entire slate. Whereas Jamison Crowder is a lot more expensive, you know, though he's you know lower on the depth chart than somebody like McKenzie. And he's going to be like 10% owned. If you're looking for the ultimate pivot on the slate, it'd be Jamison Crowder because it's not like Buffalo doesn't play their fourth and fifth wide receivers. In fact, Gabriel Davis last year, I believe was number four on the depth chart, at least to start the season, worked his way into number three. Number two was worked in as an X for some of their downfield plays. So he got more usage as the year went on, but guys like Crowder, I'd expect to see on for 30, maybe even 50% of snaps there for the first week. So don't completely count him out at five grand. Sure, he's going to be a little bit touchdown dependent or at least big play dependent out there, maybe only playing that 25 to 50% snap share. But at least for me, if he's going to be super low owned, it might be enough to take a little bit of a stab on him. So we'll have to see. I at least wanted to give him some airtime. Same thing with Dawson Knox. I like him. He's going to be a lot more reliable because he is that starting tight end, should play 90% plus of snaps, if not 100% for somebody like Dawson, who's also a great run blocker. So I like him there. 
Moving down into the depths of the pricing board here, we have guys like Van Jefferson who may or may not play. I really worry more about the situation if he doesn't play because that would open up the number two wide receiver role, which I mean, actually I say number three, you know, somebody like Allen Robinson is going to play on the outside, but Van Jefferson Jr., also a little bit more of an outside type of guy, right? He's not going to play that many snaps in the slot. I mean, if anything, they're going to put Cooper Cup there. Let somebody like Van Jefferson Jr. and Allen Robinson flank the sides. I expect that to be the usual setup, but you know, who replaces him, right? You'd expect as the quote unquote number three wide receiver that he'd be replaced by a quote unquote you know, a slot receiver, I don't think that's the case. You know, if we go down here in terms of the depth chart, you have guys like Ben Skoranek, who played here last year, has a lot of experience, but Tutu Atwell, a little bit more of that big play wide receiver, right? Bigger bodied. They've called him out for being unbelievably talented, but maybe, maybe not as focused as some of the other players would like him to be. And he also was given time off this preseason to gear up for week one, which makes me believe that because Van Jefferson Jr. is dealing with a little bit of injury concern, they wanted to make sure that Tutu Atwell would be healthy. And if that's going to be the case, at $1,000, he might crack the slate open. So I wanted to mention, I know I have him blacked out there. His ownership's relatively low right now, pretty much no attention at the captain slot, which makes a lot of sense to me. I do think that if we get report throughout the week that Van Jefferson Jr. is going to be out, might want to fire up my good old boy Tutu Atwell there. Might make a lot of sense. But in terms of the defenses and kickers, I'm never a huge fan. I will play them in the flex spot sparingly, usually matching the field at the very most. But I do not go over the field on them, and I do not play them in the captain slot. That is a hard, fast rule that I go by. If we end up getting something like we had with the Patriots and Bills game, so be it. It happens like once a year. You had the Cowboys defense as the optimal play at captain once last year. So two instances out of the entire year that we have that happen, I'll take my chances, right? It's like when you get hit with the green there on, on roulette, right? It happens. It just is what it is. You're not going to account for it all that many times or else you're playing a losing game to begin with. It's why the strategy and playing green there in roulette is not necessarily the best idea. Let's talk about some of the true fringe options. You're talking about second, sometimes like fourth, fifth string wide receivers here on like second, third string running backs. James Cook and Zach Moss are in a little bit of muddied waters. So as of right now, Zach Moss is listed as the true RB2. James Cook, their draft kick from this year, in fact, they put quite a bit of draft equity behind James Cook this year, is listed as RB3. I don't know if I buy that. So as of right now, and the guy that I have my eye on, I projected for five fantasy points, is James Cook. So $2,800 projected for 8.7% projected ownership, um, 0.9 at the captain slot. So believe it or not, I do think that people might play James Cook here because he's kind of a goal line kind of back, you know, similar to a Zach Moss, I'd say similar bodied, maybe a little bit more explosive. So that's why I'm not really buying the whole Zach Moss is our backup thing. While he's reliable, he's definitely not the future of this team at running back. That's clear as can be, can be James Cook. We know that. Maybe they're okay just, you know, waiting, letting him get ready over the next season there on the sidelines, you know, getting stronger, faster, more acquainted to NFL offenses before you throw him out there. But we've seen these college running backs just burst onto the scene and snap. Maybe that's James Cook. Maybe they knew something that we don't. He's going to go out there, get a few more snaps than we expect. I have a sinking feeling that that is going to be the case. So I'm definitely going to be on James Cook here at $2,800. I'll also have a little bit of Zach Moss, but the one that I'm getting clear leverage to the field on, the one that I'm prioritizing here, the one I have projected higher is James Cook. So that's the one that I'd prefer. Um, in terms of Isaiah McKenzie, he's going to be a talking point that we have to discuss there on Wednesday. So uh, I'm thinking there on, on Wednesday, we might do another piece of content or a live stream here for this and certainly on Thursday. So I um, expect for sure a live stream on Thursday. That'll be sometime that afternoon covering the slate there tonight um, on my Patreon page on Discord. I'll also be doing a live stream for all of my patrons I'm doing my lineup building process. We'll be talking about that on Thursday night, uh, but might do one on Wednesday too. So stay tuned for that. Uh, Mackenzie will have a much better idea on that. He's dealing with the injury. If he's starting, he's going to be mega chalk and somebody, something that uh, everybody has to design on, uh, has to decide on because he's going to be like 50% out, which is a little bit ridiculous. Um, ben Skoranek, I'm okay with. I think that he's, 
you know, especially if we have somebody like Van Jefferson not play, would be a little bit more attractive, you know, kind of like a 2-2 two -two Atwell. Um, would definitely get at least a 25 to 50% snap share, so we'll have to see about it. As of right now, not that attractive. Kyron Williams, I will be playing. I talked about him potentially taking some of the number two running back role instead of a Darrell Henderson Jr., and I do expect that because of Cam Akers coming back from injury once again, I'm probably not going to get his full workload out there. I might want to keep an eye on somebody like a Kyron, so even though as a number three, might see a few snaps at running back. Tommy Sweeney, though. This guy won the job for backup tight end. So he had, I forget who it was, it was OJ Howard out there on the Bills. He ended up getting cut by them. Um, he's $400. I don't think DraftKings thought he was going to make the team because of the OJ Howard edition. And they were going to pay OJ Howard good money there. But Sweeney won over the job. And Sweeney last year, he scored a few touchdowns, broke a few slates here at like $400, $600, $800 a few times. Uh, it would not surprise me to happen once again. Now, would I put him at captain? Absolutely not. I think that would definitely be a little bit foolish out there. But at 400 bucks, do I think he could score a touchdown? Go out there, get you 8 to 10 fantasy points? Certainly. I'm at 0.4% owned right now. So he's kind of like one of those flyers that I'm just taking a shot on uh, that I'm probably going to play in like 15% of lineups. Take a little bit of a gamble here for showdown because if you're new to this, right, and you're thinking, Tommy Sweeney, Tutu Atwell, who's this guy trying to tell me to play? Then you probably haven't played DraftKings Showdown football before and that's fine right but you'll come you'll come to learn playing it and with some experience that those are the exact sort of players that win you showdown slates it's uh it's wild it's a single game sample size and when somebody's a thousand dollars or four hundred dollars especially in the case of a tommy sweeney here he opens up so many outcomes up top like it's pretty much a free slot right you essentially have like nearly fifty thousand dollars for your last five slots you can essentially spend 10 grand a slot so even if you want to take cooper cup a captain really push it there you can live here in the six seven eight and even 10k range for the rest of your players it's it's what it buys you taking him at four hundred dollars not necessarily so much his 2.5 point projection right but if he scores a touchdown right gets you that top end volatility maybe scores you eight and a half fantasy points um, that's that's what we're looking for, right? The eight and a half fantasy points, that's pretty much for free. And then building your lineup, which is top end studs with the rest of your five spots. So that's what I like there. A few other candidates for that. We need to figure out if somebody like McKenzie isn't playing. Okay, so that's a huge caveat right there. Who's going to play receiver for Buffalo? We know Jamison's going to be the slot if that happens, but who's the number four wide receiver? Is it Jake Kumaro? Does it end up being Khalil Shakur? Both of them ended up making the team there. Um, also, Quinn Morse is the third string tight end, so that's worth noting, but I'm not going to play him there. Um, that's probably a little bit too much of a fringe option for me, particularly because Sweeney's only $200 more, and he's the clear tight end too there, also the more athletic receiving tight end. But at wide receiver, it's a little bit more intriguing. Right, like who's going to take that number four slot if McKenzie doesn't end up suiting up? So um, I'll have my eye on that. I'm trying to get reports from the team, from the beat reporters on who that's going to be if he ends up getting rolled out. So I'm going to have my eye on that, right? Make sure to stop on by for the live stream on Thursday. We'll be able to give you a little bit of a better idea on that. Perhaps Jake Kumaro or Khalil Shakur ends up being one of the better plays on the slate um, because of some injury news. So that's important to keep in mind, right? I guess with closing thoughts here, you know, McKenzie, also Van Jefferson Jr., could end up opening up a lot of these really low tier options, right? That are like here at like $200, a thousand with two, two out well, right? Like $1,800 Ben Skoranek. If not, you might have to be a little bit more balanced about it, right? Whereas we might only have like a Tommy Sweeney at our disposal, right? A few guys up here, like a cook at $2,800. We're not going to be as studs and duds. So on Thursday, again, I'll remind you, we will have a live stream there on Thursday. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss that. Then um, we're going to have a much better idea of how we can build. And a lot of it just comes down to injuries, right? Perhaps somebody even goes down during practice this week and hopefully not, right? You know, fingers crossed. I don't want to see any injuries out there, but if there are, it could really change this slate. So uh, just uh, keep that in mind throughout the week, especially if you're watching this a little bit later on. All right, boys, that is all I've got for Thursday's preview. Really looking forward to this season. Again, if you want all of my projections, they are on my Patreon page. But before you hop on out of here, go ahead and smash that like button. Also, make sure to go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you haven't gone ahead and already done so. That way, you don't miss any of the football content throughout the year. There'll be plenty of showdown previews, just like the one you just watched for Sunday Night Football, Monday 
Monday Night Football for every game throughout the year, and also going to cover the main slates, putting out some of my top value targets, a few of the stacks that I really have my eyes on for the plays week to week, and of course, live streams to cover it all beforehand. So for the showdown slates, we'll be going live the day of to give you an idea of some of the inactives and actives and how we need to react to it. And then on the flip side for the main slate, going to go live, I believe, on Friday nights. So a little bit earlier there, a few days before, but we'll have all of the injury reports and activity reports from practices from Monday through Friday. So we'll have a good idea on who's going to play then, right? And it'll kind of be our first reaction to who's actually going to be active for the weekend, right? Who the potential chalk might end up being, that sort of thing. So a lot of content coming to you. I'm really excited for it. But remember, Golf content isn't going anywhere, right? So if you're one of my golf fans out there, right, you know, a lot of you, most of you out there that are subscribed are here for golf. That is not going to be going anywhere either. There will be course breakdowns, also live streams for showdown throughout the entire year too. Just uh, a lot more busy around here, a lot more content. So, uh, hey, if you're looking for DFS advice out there, you're looking for even more content from me, that's exactly what you're going to get. So I'm looking forward to it, guys. Let's go out there and get this cash on Thursday, and I'll see you guys for the live stream as well.